So welcome on back from the best snacks we've ever had at a seminar in MSE. Anytime there's cured meat and olives involved, for those of you watching online, sorry you missed it. Go somewhere, have a fine cheese. Um, but it's now my opportunity to start off our panel discussion. Um, so we heard about a specific aspect of 3D manufacturing and advanced materials and materials discovery. And so we have a panel of folks from across campus and across the country uh, to discuss that with you. And I do notice that all the students are sitting back further, so we will have to pass the mic around. But what I'd like to do is turn it over to Professor Mike Titus uh, to introduce the rest of the panel and lay out kind of the ground rules of how we'll have this discussion. So. All right. Thank you, Dave. Uh, so welcome, everyone. Uh, today, the panel discussion topic will be how do new materials change the things around you? So. Our panelists today are Professor Teresa Pollack, whom you've already met from her great lecture today. Uh, so the Associate Dean and our co-distinguished Professor of Materials at UC Santa Barbara. Also my former uh, PhD advisor, so never thought nine years from when I started we'd be sitting here, but <laughs> here we are. Never know. Next down the line is uh, Dr. Mark Grunninger. He is the Managing Director for Industrial Consortia here at Purdue University, formerly President of Praxair Surface Technologies. Thank you, Mark. Uh, moving on down the line is Dr. Rob Carter. He's an advisor of the Barnes Group Advisors, uh, formerly Director for Advanced Materials and Process Engineering at Stryker Orthopedics. And before that, uh, the Branch Chief for Materials Manufacturing Technology at the Army Research Lab. Thank you. And last but not least is uh, Professor John Sutherland. He is the Fezenfeld Family Head of Environmental and Ecological Engineering at Purdue. Thank you. So uh, the way that we're going to schedule this today is the first 30 minutes, um, we'll kind of have some discussions uh, up here uh, between, I guess, the five, four of us. And then we'll transfer it over to you all. So the last 30 minutes, we'll, we'll take questions from you. So please uh, come up with some questions to ask our four panelists today. Um, so first thing I'd like to kind of discuss is how new materials and processes have impacted your particular technology areas. And so in, uh, in discussing this, if we could kind of go down the line and briefly introduce yourselves um, and, and kind of relate to how new materials have, have impacted your technology areas. Let's start at that end. <laughs> so I can start. So my background is manufacturing. And I'm actually uh, trained as a mechanical and industrial engineer. But about 30 years ago, I realized that uh, many of the environmental challenges that we presently deal with were actually created by mechanical and industrial and materials and electrical engineers. So I've spent the last 30 years trying to uh, uh, help people make better uh, manufacturing related decisions, not only in terms of productivity, in terms of cost, and, but also in terms of the environment. Rob Carter uh, with well, the Barnes Group, but prior to that I had pretty much the same job in two different sectors. Um, I worked with the Department of Defense where we kind of lived at the intersection between materials and manufacturing. So we would take new uh, material breakthroughs that were coming out of the laboratories and we looked into how did you actually scale those, how did you get them into manufacturing. And one of the areas that we were looking into, whether it was for uh, new gun barrels or uh, erosion uh, resistant coatings or new armor materials. Uh, usually you would come out of the lab and you'd make something about the size of a sugar cube or maybe a little bit bigger. Now you had to scale that into something that would go into an entire vehicle. Uh, so we would actually start doing the research to look into how do you address the manufacturing requirements? How do you make sure the material processing is maintained from the kind of lab scale all the way up to producing a larger scale part? Um, so we, we did a lot of research with that, and I can, I can talk probably offline for a long, long time uh, in that area, but also in the medical device space, we were doing the same type things, where how do you take new breakthrough materials and get those matured? Um, for the medical device space, it's a little bit more challenging because you actually have a regulatory body that actually really imposes a significant amount of requirements on top of you. So just dropping a new material is not something you can do. You have to go back and do a lot of research to prove it out. So it, it Basically, where does new materials do for me? They, they gave me a job, so it's been really a lot of fun. So, uh, Hi, I'm Mark Grunninger. As Mike was uh, kind enough to mention, 
Uh, while I've had the pleasure of being here at Purdue for since the beginning of this year, I spent most of my career in a variety of uh, roles uh, on technical and then commercial with a company called Praxair Surface Technologies. Uh, for those of you who may be somewhat aware of that company, it's a fairly large materials and coatings uh, provider and uh, do a lot of advanced materials work in particular for aerospace applications and uh, in my role both aerospace and a lot of electronics applications. And so uh, for me, um, the, what new materials uh, taught me and being involved with those over uh, many, many years working for Praxair was similar to what you've heard John and Rob talk about. Uh, the, the application innovation of materials is always exciting when you can find something that works. That's a, that's a terrific kind of accomplishment where someone's saying, yeah, that works and we want to buy that from you. And then I can tell you when another type of excitement comes when you want to make more than one or two, you want to make thousands and thousands of gallons or parts or coatings and then you have to kind of understand the science behind what's going on and how that applies in making it from one, more than one to two. And having had the opportunity to do that for a variety of electronic applications and aircraft engine applications and other applications really made for an exciting career. You can't make it without materials and, uh, and producers know that and suppliers know that and I had a wonderful time doing that in a variety of applications for Praxair. Okay, I guess the only thing, can you hear me? Yeah, the only thing you can, uh, I would add to my background, I'm obviously an academic, so suspect, uh, but I did once uh, or twice have, have real jobs, uh, one being at GE Aviation, and, and my job there was alloy development, and so I did actually develop an alloy that eventually flew, and I think uh, it was long after I left, though, so what I gained from that experience was sort of a profound uh, appreciation for the difference between finding something interesting in the lab and actually getting it into uh, a product. And, and it's something that I've tried to help pass on to students, the understanding that if you're just standing in the lab finding an interesting material, that doesn't mean you're developing a material, it just means you're understanding material. And there is an important distinction, and there's obviously an important role for both. So. Yeah, so launching off of that, can some of you give some examples of how new material has really you know, changed, reinvigorated an industry, or, or even started up a new one? And can you kind of walk us through the process it takes to design, develop, and eventually deploy that new material into a system component? So I, I'll just comment that one of the things that I'm excited about in terms of um, additive, and Teresa talked a little bit about that today, I think, uh, what is, is its uh, opportunity to contribute to remanufacturing, which is taking a used product and, and bringing it back to new or even better than new uh, specifications. And I think that's really uh, very exciting because, you know, I spend a, a big part of my life thinking about how can we close some of these material loops, component loops, so that our, um, that we're not discarding the, these uh, uh, products that we've uh, invested uh, our, our energy, our water, our, our sweat to create in the first place. So I, I think it's tremendous opportunity, new materials, whatever we can, uh, if they can prolong the life of, of components and avoid Premature replacement, that's fantastic, and remanufacturing via additive is, is great. We had a number of material systems that we were bringing up, you know, new alloys that we were trying to introduce, and I, I guess, and I'm sure you had the same experience, which is, it's amazing how hard it is to actually get a new material all the way through all the different test processes to demonstrate the manufacturability of it. Um, to truly appreciate what it means to go into manufacturing. And you really have to understand, you know, statistical processes of your manufacturing process. You have to understand whatever regulatory body that has kind of say over how your new material is, is control, you know, controlled or, or uh, released. Um, 
it, it really is uh, very, very far removed from kind of the R&D world. Um, and it, one of the things I would recommend um, is if you ever get the opportunity to do uh, a tour of a production facility or, or see and uh, get a chance to talk to people like that, that's a really uh, kind of eye-opening experience to try to really understand what it takes to get a material from R&D all the way into a production phase. Um, it's incredibly complicated. Um, you know, I'm, I'm assuming most of the students in here are you know, researchers uh, looking into uh, different directions in their career. It really is amazing to, uh, and, and from, I, I don't know, I, PhD in material science, I love research. You get into kind of the application of the, the manufacturing portion of it and all the, the manufacturing engineering. I find that incredibly boring. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's hard to do, but it, it, that's how you gotta generate all the statistics, but, but that's what you gotta do. So it, it's hard to do, but you gotta appreciate it. Help me get my master's degree. <laughs> I agree with John about his comments about additive. Um, however, uh, in an attempt to answer your question, Mike, uh, the first real experience I had with commercializing a new product came about maybe when a lot of the students here were just being born. About 20 years ago, there was a product called Windows 95. Everyone, <laughs> anyone hear about that product? And Windows 95 was, one of its operational problems was the fact that it was a memory hog. I know Teresa talked about terabytes. Back then, megabytes was a big problem. And the way to get megabytes on your disk drive was making the disk as flat as possible. So as a PhD ceramic engineer, we had to develop some what are called polishing compounds to make those disks as flat as possible. And the way we would make them in the lab scale was making things that were a gallon, a five gallon pail, and I can remember the first time we got an order for 50,000 gallons of that. <laughs> so it was a big chemical engineering challenge, a big materials processing challenge, but it was a challenge that helped move Windows 95 forward because we had to make so many more disks. Back then, <laughs> disks would have three disks per drive. Now today you use a lot different type of memory, but I can remember the very exciting times thinking about how do I do something that I did in a in a pail and would polish a hundred disks with to Seagate Technologies just placed an order of 50,000 gallons of this stuff that they want actually delivered in a certain amount of time and how are we going to do that? Lots of challenges there combining the academic technology and the real life manufacturing to make sure all that stuff comes out the way the customer who's paying for that wants it. Well, I guess I, I would reflect back to my, my original experience of, of, of going to GE and, you know, fresh out of graduate school, and, and they're like, ha, PhD from MIT, we'll show her. And, and they're like, develop a new alloy. So, you know, I go to the lab and I do some things, and everything had to be design of experiments, which was totally frustrating, but understandable. And, and, you know, something eventually good comes out, and I'm like thinking I'm finished. And they're like, go make blades. <laughs> and, and so you go off to Whitehall, Michigan, where the only place where they make them, and it's a disaster. And then they declare it not possible. And then you have to like show them all the fundamental reasons why it can work. And then you have to make lots of them. And, and, and so it was, it was a tremendous learning experience. But, but the, the whole business of, of, you know, going from something which is a demonstra demonstrably good idea to production is, is, takes so many different disciplines, you know, not just materials, it takes everything. And so um, being able to, to be interested in all the different facets of that is, is important for success, I think. You have to, to keep your eyes open to, to all the other disciplines that are important to engineering to get something done. So, so I think you all in some way have kind of touched upon the valley of death where you have this great new uh, awesome alloy and then all of a sudden you know a bunch of them don't work and you slog through it and finally you get an alloy that works at the end going through your manufacturing processes. Are there things that we can do at the university level or uh, things that students should, should be looking for in order to kind of 
for their careers and, and for us as engineers reduce that time period in, in the valley of death, so to speak, or eliminate it entirely? Do we need to do more upfront thinking about the manufacturability of new materials? Well, as someone that was trained in manufacturing, I, I guess my answer would be yes, right? So, uh, and, I, and I am recently working with many scientists that I would say probably, well, the, the expertise that I'm providing to them is on economic guidance and, and you know, trying to move their technologies which often exist at a TRL one or two level to something that you know is three or four and that that oftentimes requires expertise that they just don't have so these things that Teresa talked about like designed experiments and simple simple things like engineering economy and and some of the you know development of business plans and so forth and I know Purdue is, has got uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, guidance and support that we can we can give to students in these areas. So, uh, yeah, I think th this is a great great opportunity. I totally agree with you. Um, I mean, I, I would say actually get to know your customer, or you know, all the pathway to your customer, um, because it is a, a tremendous number of different backgrounds that need to come together to get a part into production, make profit. Um, working in the medical device space, one of the things I thought was amazing is you know, you'd be in a meeting, you'd be talking about some new concept for a component, and honestly, one of the most powerful people in the room was the marketing guy. Because the marketing guy could sit there and go, that will never sell, and the conversation's over. You're, you're just done at that point. You could sit there and say, scientifically, great idea, this is gonna make you know, life so much better, never sell, done. So you, you do need to appreciate there, there are a lot of other influences into a what may be a great technical idea maybe a terrible business idea and understanding that it's a much bigger problem than just the technical problem you want to solve so having had the opportunity to sit with a number of marketing guys they're like everyone else sometimes they're right and sometimes they're wrong so if you think you're right stick with stick to your guns uh, as far as what the university can do um, you know uh, having had the pleasure of being affiliated as a volunteer with the School of Materials Engineering for a few years and seeing the curriculum. I, I think uh, the curriculum is uh, very robust and offers students a chance to kind of get some of this uh, real life experience, if you will, especially in the second two years. But remembering that education is a two-way street, right? You know, it's, it's not just what the curriculum is, it's what the students make of the curriculum. If you can come to a lecture like this, if you can probe your teachers about what experiences they've had in, you know, in, uh, in industrial settings, that's going to benefit the students as much as anything that's in the course curriculum. Because the curriculum that I've seen here at Purdue and other places is excellent. If you're a junior or senior, you know, engineer trying to be uh, thinking about doing something industrial, Ask your professors about what their experiences are and probe deeper that way. That'll be uh, very meaningful within the context of the, of the courses that they have. So I guess I'll take a really long view to this question. And, and maybe it's on my mind because just yesterday in Santa Barbara, it was announced that some real quantum computing happened. And, and I think the way to speed anything up is is to have a good, hopefully physics-based model of what it is you want to do. And so if you imagine what the computational power is by the time you all are trying to do some of these things, I think, it, I think the answer is in sort of developing, integrating, and, and using the power of both models and data to, to try things out before you spend two years in the lab and and you know on very small ways we're already able to do that and what we find is that it leads us in a completely different path than than what perhaps we were demand that was demanded of us in that design of experiments approach which is well try this try that and try that the machine learning says go over here and so i i think 
if, there, if there's suites of tools that walk you through manufacturing processes, you can probably avoid a lot of the mistakes that, that are made along the way. So I, I think becoming, as students, uh, becoming computationally savvy, I'm an experimentalist, by the way, um, is, it, or at least having command of, of what's available and, and some level of ability to use those tools is, is going to help things look different in the future. And, and so assuming we have this brand new material and it works in a process or we're developing another process, I, and we, we get to the finish line and now it's marketable and we're selling it. Um, how, how much of the circular economy comes into the, I guess, early design and development process and uh, particularly related to additive, what are we doing now that is maybe a, a pitfall down the road that we're not maybe considering up front in terms of the circular econ economy? So I think David asked me to be on the panel because of this particular question. So, um, so w there's a few things that I've learned over the years. One of them is that we need to think about the life cycle and, in fact, multiple life cycles of components, products, and what we're going to do with materials at some point when the product is no longer functional. Uh, and, and this is so because of the, unless there's a breakthrough in terms of energy and water, we have to continue to, to find new sources uh, and new ways to create energy. And, and the water is, is kind of real difficult unless we get untapped amounts of energy and we can desalinate at will. So, so these become an issue and, of course, we don't want to be buried in our waste. So we've got to work out some of these uh, uh, circular economy type issues. And in order to do that, we've got to, got to have the good, as Teresa said, good understanding of the physics and the, uh, the chemistry and, and uh, uh, do things that make sense in terms of the environment and the ec economics. And so that means recycling, remanufacturing, reuse, extending product life, and, and making wise decisions up front during design. In the DOD, we were looking at two different areas. One is repair parts using additive manufacturing. We were developing um, cold spray additive processes to go ahead and be able to uh, repair a lot of our parts. Uh, turns out that, say, in a helicopter, you have a lot of magnesium uh, housings that are incredibly prone to corrosion and wear. They're very soft. Um, so what ends up happening is you will have wear on a, a flange or, or at a mating interface. And just a little bit of wear will get it to where it no longer seals properly. It goes outside a spec, pull this fairly expensive casting out, and it can't be used. So we were showing that we could, with a very small amount of repair, you could get this manufactured or remanufactured back into spec and put back into service and that was that was a really fascinating and eye-opening the you know billions of dollars are, are spent each year undoing the damage that corrosion does to the DOD um, so this was a, a really rewarding program to go into uh, leaning forward a little bit one of the things we were looking into is for uh, logistics um, when we deploy our, our forces anywhere, where, wherever they go, you, you've got to send material, you know, spares, other things. So there's a, a long trail of, of trucks right behind you with all the parts you need. Um, so we were looking into how do you take an additive manufacturing? Could I deploy a, a printer up front so that a soldier can then print whatever part they need? Now you only have to send raw material. Well, turns out the logistics footprint of packing a printer and powders and all these other things is even worse than packing a bunch of parts. So we had to go back and rethink it. And, and one of the areas where it really made a lot of sense is if I could start recycling my waste stream, which would be, you know, the water bottles. You know, there's a joke that you can follow an army and see where they've been because you can follow the trail of batteries and water bottles all over the country, you know, countryside. Um, so if we could go ahead and recycle any of those materials and make them into printable feedstocks, now we would actually be reducing our logistics footprint and giving better capability to somebody that's in a, you know, a pretty far away from a logistics uh, force to get them what they need. So a lot of interesting research. There is a, a tremendous amount of opportunity in that space. Uh, for the circular economy, 
I like the cert sustainability circular part that you all were discussing. You know, as the businessman I was for as long as I was, I kind of focus on the economy side. And um, I think Teresa's title about the crossroads of additive manufacturing, some of the companies I've uh, advised on additive manufacturing, they, they like to call it the Wild West. Because uh, right now, basically, a lot of things are going on on materials technology, equipment technology, uh, and of course, most importantly, from my perspective, application technology. What applications are actually going to be runners in, in the circular economy of additive? And I think Teresa's talk hit the two nails on the head. It's going to be, at least at the beginning, aerospace um, and medical. High value is also, she mentioned, and I think that's accurate as well. If you're in defense, there's a lot of money, so there's, that's uh, possible as well. But to me, I think where the investment dollars are going right now, if you kind of look at it, is spots where you have a real chance to commercialize applications. And so to me, the economic answer to that is you'll see applications evolve very rapidly. It's $3 billion now. The part industry in aerospace is 100 times that. So you're talking about a 1% penetration. For it to become a 15 or 20% penetration in 10 or 15 years in an industry with a very long cycle time, uh, you know, it's going to have to be some pretty economically viable applications and technologies associated with it. So I guess more generally with regard to the circular economy, not so much an attitude, but this came to mind based on your comments and uh, a meeting that I was at that was the 100th anniversary of the Royal Swedish Academy. And, and there were some talks on sustainability and I was, I was shocked uh, from the point of view that how carefully they thought about collecting electronics and what to do about the waste and, and, and the, the detailed thinking about that that I, I think I don't see in the U.S. to the same degree. And yet if you look at the power and water situation in the not too distant future, surely you know, somebody has to do something about this. So I, I think from the point of view of the U.S. and people who are young, the, there have to be tremendous opportunities there. So just sort of from the perspective of how would I do some of these things if I can imagine power and water are limited, or how do, how do some of these things relate to the fact that all of that, powder, that power will be coming from a grid that's got a huge fraction of renewables, and, and you know, how, how can I do things locally uh, in a way that isn't really traditional big manufacturing? And so with this company I showed, APL Technologies, this is a group of students that took plant waste, ground up seeds in the garage and figured out how to turn them into a coating that, that protects plants. So they took something, they're taking the waste and making a valuable coating and, and the next thing they know, the 90 people with contracts with Costco and Walmart and all of those sorts of places. So it, it's sort of a, it's a it was a, a mindset that sort of, uh, you know, we should do things differently that got them started and so, I think doing things differently, sort of on a larger scale, you know, manufacturing-wise, aerospace, medical, I don't know. Will it happen? It, it, only if you make it happen, I guess. Let me just add one other thing, two applications, uh, one related to medical and one related to aerospace. Of course, the, the big driver in the aerospace for the additive is, is this tremendous opportunity to reduce the mass, and that's because uh, this is so important because the use stage of that aerospace product life cycle just dominates everything else. So you save a little bit of mass, then there's tremendous uh, fuel savings, which the customers love, as, as well as there being a substantial environmental benefit. And uh, the other application, the medical, many years ago I was visiting a company that made uh, um, implants for spinal surgery and they would prepare about 50 possible combinations of, of the components and then airship this, this big box to a hospital, to a doctor that, was, that would be doing the surgery. And then uh, the doctor would pull out the, the one little implant that was needed and of course the rest, everything else is contaminated at that point. So then they've got to 
ship it all back to the manufacturer. And, and this is all air shipped, right? So FedEx or something, they're flying it around the country. And I'm sterilizing everything. I'm thinking, man, this is terrible. So these days, you know, put, put the additive manufacturing at the hospital, get the size, the exact size you need, not the closest one, and, uh, you know, save tremendous amount of energy and all this uh, waste. All right, great. Well, um, I'm going to keep my promise and uh, now open the floor up for questions for those of you who have any. They were supposed to do homework. So I have a question with a, a bit of a, a personal stake in it. Um, when you guys see the future for super alloy applications, uh, do you see it being a materials, a design, or a manufacturing challenge predominantly? start off with that. Um, one of the things I'd actually say is uh, I would actually, personal, all of those are interrelated prop properties. Um, and I guess to understand that if you change the material, your design, uh, your design will change, your, your manufacturing process will change. So understand the problem, uh, I would say a little bit bigger than just, you know, hey, where is that one material going to go? Um, understand that as you get into this, they all all become very interrelated, very complicated, um, and as I said, understand that bigger picture and how it fits together in, in the application of choice. Yeah, my answer was yes. You know, I <laughs> so I, I I we have researchers that work on each each one of those things, right? And like you said, it, they're all interrelated. I think the answer is yes as well. You know, at Praxair, we were a very, very large manufacturer of a variety of super alloys. And um, as Teresa can acknowledge as a former GE employee, the life cycle of those metals are just so long in any aerospace industry. It's, it's hard to imagine even in your career that those will be transcended out. So. If the base chemistries are going to remain somewhat stable over long periods of time, which history says they have, um, my inclination would be yes, but more towards the manufacturing because, and whether that's additive or conventional or something else, um, manufacture th those alloys are going to be around. It's it's just inconceivable to think that they won't be around, and so how they're made with the properties and structure is going to be very relevant, but manufacturing is going to be as important as anything from my perspective. Well, they don't call them super alloys for nothing. <laughs> I mean, they really are amazing, right? There are, there are very few materials that could operate at 90% of their melting points and, and you know, be manufacturable by all these different paths. And so I agree, it's inconceivable that they would go away. The question is, you know, what will be different and what will be new? And I think certainly additive is a place where, where new ones are needed. And, and that's not a simple question because, you know, the, starting from day zero, there's the whole issue of the powders, which is um, a, a pretty big deal and, and lots to, to do there. There's a whole design space that people haven't really looked at, sort of between cobalt and nickel. You know, we might get to the point where we know enough about them that we can really be ta tailoring them and not really going through the same sorts of qualifications that, that we go through now. But having said that, it, you know, that's a tricky business because people are still making mistakes when they develop and implement them. And so uh, I think there's, there's a lot to be said for being more predictive about the way they behave in corrosion, oxidation, mechanical properties. Um, we're still, there's still plenty left to do there. And so the, the whole sort of predicting how they, they behave uh, after 10 years and 20 years is, is important. And they are really quite circular, right? Almost all, every ingot of superalloy that's made is probably 80% scrap or something like that. So, they're expensive enough that people really keep track of them and, <laughs> and, and reuse them whenever they can. And so it's a, it's a very interesting materials domain because they're expensive, they've been invested in, they're interesting from a scientific point of view, and so 
Don't worry about it. So, thanks. So you, you all discussed the uh, gap between what happens at the lab and, and a, a product, a commercial product that makes it, it helps benefit society. And we're all interested in closing that gap and, and MGI and ICME are focused on doing that. And I was wondering whether uh, we could learn from other fields where uh, maybe they do this better. And what I'm thinking about specifically is the semiconductor industry with the ITRS, right? The International Technology Roadmap for Semiconductors. Now it's replaced by whatever, re rebooting, uh, IEEE re rebooting. And where they had you know, very precise guidelines and, and constraints and, and targets on a almost yearly basis for their industry moving forward. And I think that helped, you know, uh, march universities behind common goals and, and looking at things that uh, they knew were, uh, you know, going to make it to the, to the markets. Is, is that something that uh, would be interesting to think about in, in other fields and in materials? So I'll, st I'll start um, having had a, spent probably about five of my 20 some odd years of career with Praxair in the electronics field and uh, running their electronics business and actually being associated with um, uh, some of that semi semitech and that, that roadmap. And the short answer is um, there's no doubt the semiconductor industry, especially 20 years ago, kind of maybe not at the beginning of the industry, but as it was really ramping up its applications, was no doubt a leader in the creation of a, a roadmap for the industry. My observation was that part of that was due to Moore's Law. Uh, for those of you who are familiar, that was Gordon Moore, Moore talking about getting, doubling the amount of transistors every certain amount of time, and um, that every year or so. And so with that kind of credo, the, the industry had to respond, how are we going to um, address that? And they did very well. Uh, that and roadmaps now are part of almost everyone's technology commercialization plan. So, I think it's absolutely a viable approach. Companies use them, industries use them. The one thing that can kind of throw a, a bit of a roadblock or a monkey wrench into it is when something a disruptor happens, a new technology. Five years ago, or maybe ten years ago, people weren't talking about additive technology. Some of the folks in Whitehall probably weren't investing in additive technology because they were trying to cost reduce what they're doing. I can assure you, the folks in Whitehall now are betting big on additive technology. So roadmaps are absolutely an excellent example. Disruptive technologies, though, can, uh, can change roadmaps quickly. And, and America Makes have, have established a, a series of roadmaps for additive manufacturing development. Um, probably don't have the fidelity that they need right now because it's, everything's still very new. Uh, I think someone said kind of the wild, wild west right now. Uh, and that's very true. So new technologies are still being developed. New material systems are being brought forward. Um, but we fully recognize, and I think Semitech and a lot of those were, were quoted as being that's the kind of milestone that we want to go after. Well, it seems to me that, that roadmaps are, are very useful if you know where you are on the S-curve, right? Right at the bottom where you're starting to do this because that sort of next phase you can kind of project what's needed and put the metrics out there and, and, and that's tremendously helpful. Uh, one of my pet peeves when we were always going around talking about the materials genome, which by the way is a terrible thing to name it, but that's what the White House did, the former White House, and it, it the thing that I kept telling everyone, which I thought would be useful, was, you know, the Human Genome Initiative put metrics out there for how fast they were going to sequence, what they were, you know, and, and they published the results of how much progress had been made every year against those metrics in Science Magazine, you can go back and track, but by virtue of the fact that those metrics were there, people jumped over those bars and went further. And so I think that's something we've always been lacking 
um, to some degree in some of these areas of materials is just sort of, you know, what are our metrics and, and how do we as a community decide where to put them? I mean, do we want to put them on, on you know, certain aspects of being predictive about manufacturing processes or, or do we want to put them on, you know, how fast we can explore a space or, but we, we have not been successful in, in making a set of metrics around many parts of the, the valley of death problem and I wish we could do that uh, to a greater extent. Just jumping in there, I guess, uh, you know, the aim for the Materials Genome Initiative was to discover, develop, and deploy new materials twice as fast. Did we uh, achieve that? Well, in the report we said 10x, so I'm glad we changed that later. <laughs> <laughs> that was maybe a little too ambitious. I, I think it's safe to say that, that that has been achieved if you pick, say, aerospace materials. There's no question that you can do that a, a lot faster. And, and so, but where have you seen that written down, right? So I, I think th this sort of some discipline around documenting it, which, you know, a lot of times people don't want to document it because that's your strategic advantage. So I, I think in materials, we're, we're close to our industry friends, but, but um, it can be hard to, to get everyone on the documentation page unless our DOD friends insist that they do it. <laughs> First, let me introduce me a little bit. Uh, my name is Liang Tian. So during my PhD, we, we designed and fabricate a novel material called aluminum matrix calcium uh, filaments reinforced composite. So the, the anticipated properties is high, high strength and high electric conductivity. So we, we want this material to be used as a high voltage power transmission cable. And we get the strength and twice as high as the industrial uh, cables and the uh, electric conductivity about 22 percent higher than the industrial cables. Yeah, this uh, basically corresponds to today's topic about new materials, how it can change your life. Yeah, but I'm going to start with my questions. <laughs> so my questions is just, uh, so w what's the primary challenges uh, uh, of uh, how to put a matter uh, additive manufacturing into industry, uh, and um, and the, the two other questions are, and so and yeah, I also saw the quantum computing uh, news yesterday. I'm just wondering, so how do you see the future of uh, quantum computing would affect the the computational design, the experiment, also how the computational design helps experiment designing new materials. Yeah, that's my two questions. Thank you. So the first one, I, I, well, I'll start talking. I, I don't have an answer, but uh, um, so the first question related to what you perceive to be the barriers to additive manufacturing in industry. Okay. So I would say speed, productivity, cost, all right? But mostly speed. Reproducibility. Yeah. yeah I'd also throw in the, the one of the problems you're running into right now is as you're trying to get things, um, additive parts into a flight critical system. Uh, the maturity, the reproducibility, um, additive printers are very good at printing geometries, but Geometry is just a shape. A part has a function, and you have to prove that what you printed can function. And that, that's the, gets into qualification and, and verification. That's a totally different game, and, and that's early. You, you will see a handful of parts have made through that. The GE fuel injector, a few other parts have actually been qualified and are now flying. Um, so. I would say that, that most printers right now are still kind of early. Uh, they do not have the reproducibility. Uh, they're just now getting to the quality. The material systems are being, I'll say, matured enough to actually get through. 
Um, so you're now, it's still an early technology. So you, that's where the, that's the barrier you're running into with some of the more critical applications. Cost is obviously, at the end of the day, it always comes down to cost. Um, you've got to be able to show whatever use case you're going to is, there's a benefit to doing it. Uh, so while it might be technologically beautiful, it, it, if it doesn't make the, the cost metric, it, it's not going to go. So there, there's a lot of factors into that. Thank you. There's no way I can answer your second question. So, <laughs> so I'll have to just say ditto to, to John and Bob's uh, comments because they hit the nail on the head. It's, if you have for additive to become more commercial than a $3 billion industry, which is already, you know, nothing to sneeze at, but to move, once you start moving into some of the very high volume things, it's going to take time in two pretty long life cycle or two pretty long product qualification cycle industries, medical and aerospace. Medical because doctors are inherently very conservative people and aerospace because they're even more conservative. So um, I'm going to let Teresa talk about the, qu <laughs> the quantum <laughs> calculus. The quantum computing part, I would have to say, uh, I'll, I'll turn it around on you. That's, that's, that's your job. <laughs> You're supposed to tell us what it's going to do. Yeah. So I, I completely agree about the reproducibility problem. And I, I think you know, that's, that comes back to us as materials people a little bit. We need to think harder about you know, NDE approaches and, and things that we can do to probe those structures without destroying them because somebody's probably going to have to check everyone. And, and so they're, they're, you know, they're, they're not always large objects, so there's some things that we might do there. Uh, quantum computing, uh, there are so many different approaches that people are thinking about, all of which require some materials innovations, and so there's, there's going to be some materials jobs there for, for quite some time, as far as I can see. But I think, you know, in the long run, it will happen. So I, I think the thing you should be thinking about quantum computing is that, that, you know, somewhere along the line, there's going to be this tremendous capability, and so you should be thinking forward that that, that will become available, and that will probably change a lot of things uh, that, we, that we do. And so it's early days, like I said, just this week, I think uh, was a breakthrough, but it's, it's, you know, there's algorithms about using these approaches and there's, there's so many things left to do. It's gonna be a long time before it's sitting on our desktop, but, but eventually, you know, it, it will be a breakthrough, I predict. Yeah, uh, can I do a follow up question? So I think the price of the alloy powder right now for additive manufacturing is really high. Is that the kind of the prime, one of the primary challenges? So having some experience of actually manufacturing powders for a living for quite some time, uh, and Teresa's comment around the recycling of powder was, was dead nuts. You know, when you have high value raw materials like cobalt and nickel. Not super high like platinum or gold or silver, but not low like iron. Um, the manufacturing costs have to incorporate the recycling and the reutilization of those materials. Um, the way you get at that economically, fundamentally, is through technology and volume. And as the volumes rise, you can invest in technology that's inherently more cost effective for higher volumes. And there are about two or three significant powder makers who are doing that right now. And I can tell you the bets they're putting down are not small bets. So they believe, they're betting, they're investing in technology that they think they can leverage over volume to kind of make it attractive. And my guess is when you're at less than 1% penetration of aerospace market and other markets out there, the technology to do things in bulk for expensive alloys will come and will you know, be manifest in lower or at least acceptable price powders in uh, applications that can generate the value and returns on these hundred million dollar plus investments in, in aggregate to, to supply that type of volume. I don't know if that answered your question or if there's other comments. Thank you. Is 
there are also a number of, um, if you look at the total breakdown of a lot of costs, depending on how much extra machining, inspection, you can actually run it into that the material cost, the powder cost is a, a not tremendous portion of the total cost of the part. Um, you know, if, if you have uh, hipping uh, CT, you know, for a very uh, specific part, you have to go back and do a lot of touch-up machining, those costs will easily dwarf your, your powder costs so it makes it a very expensive part. So you know, there's plenty of room for improvement in the additive manufacturing process. So if you can make your surface finish better, uh, if you can make you know a, a in situ inspection or something along those lines, so that you minimize the the after uh, uh, inspection requirements, those are all areas that can improve. So the, there there are a lot of ways. You know, the powder costs are coming down. Um, there, there are a lot of opportunities to change the economics of, of 3D printing. Uh, you essentially an answered this question in your last response, but I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more on um, how industries and businesses reconcile the high overhead costs of impl implementation of more sustainable methods of design and manufacturing, particularly additive manufacturing and your idea of remanufacturing. So the way I would answer that is it's a valuation activity. And I say that because companies do things to make sure their values stay high. And if they can't do things that are sustainable, their values will not stay high. So um, what employees of companies who are maybe not directly involved with the financial elements of valuation and sustainability, what they're chartered to do is identify investments, technologies, materials, processes, products that are inherently more sustainable than what they're currently being, that's what's currently being done. And I can tell you that's a very active kind of engineering activity right now, is to look at things in corporations to make them more, I'm just gonna say sustainable, um, and what those investments are and, and how that will improve the overall you know, cycle, economic cycle of the products that the company is making and you know, endeavors to make in their foreseeable future. So I, I can just comment a little bit. Things have, I started doing this work back in about 91, 92, and things have changed a lot. You know, as, as was noted, at least this is on the company's radar it's in the, it's on the minds of students all over the place right so at least in my mind you know things are looking a lot better now than they did in in the 90s and and i think you know we've we've made a lot of progress and you know the move the needle so to speak there's still a lot of discussion about how do you balance kind of the three pillars of sustainability economy you know, society and the environment. And it, some of these are, are challenging, you know. But a, it, a lot of the, the great solutions, they, they come back to design and coming up with the great ideas in the first place. Um, hi, <clears throat> excuse me. I, uh, I'm a sophomore in materials engineering, and I don't know if this is the type of questions you're looking for. Um, but do you have any advice for someone who's just starting out, you know, sort of wide-eyed stepping into um, materials? Enjoy the ride. Okay. <laughs> well, I, I would say I would second that. I mean, it's it's a, a fascinating field. It it's almost endless. It touches everything. You can go from physical to medical to just about anywhere. So it's, it's a, a great space to go and explore, find what really it, you know, draws you into it, and yeah, it's, it, it's, everything's made out of material, so. <laughs> I, I would say there's never been a better time. I mean, at every area of materials has just got exciting things going on, and, and so I, I think your first task is to you know, learn about those areas and figure out what, what 
grabs you the most, but at the same time, don't forget, there's all these other related disciplines that are gonna help you do materials, computer science and parts of electrical engineering and mechanical engineering. And so um, obviously in four years, you're not gonna have time for all of that, but you can at least uh, be aware of what's going on around you and, and don't forget to take advantage of, of what the university offers is all these extra things that go beyond your discipline that you have to trudge across campus to take advantage of, but um, you know, once you leave here, that, that doesn't happen anymore, so, so make the most of it. And you have an airport, airport, so don't forget to get your pilot's license. That was my biggest mistake. <laughs> well, okay. One quick question, a little bit maybe different, but sometimes as new materials, new products are introduced, and when there's a lot of dollars involved in introducing them, uh, there are some perhaps detrimental side effects that you don't see. I wonder if there are some case studies, some ethical case studies you can point to maybe that can help people understand some of the decisions they're making uh, and maybe look at things that have happened in the past to make sure that you're making a good choice now as you're rolling out uh, a new product or a new material. So you're familiar with MTBE? So this was the gasoline additive that uh, we introduced a number of years ago to, you know, help uh, help uh, reduce uh, uh, emissions, right? Anybody remember this? Yeah. We still use an MTBE? No. Turns out it uh, it was a problem. So, unfortunately, that is often the case. You know, people come up with good ideas. And I'm not suggesting we need to slow down and, you know, that, that's bad because then you'll never do anything. There's risks in everything we do. Uh, but a, a little bit more foresight, perhaps, in, in terms of thinking about new ideas and new technologies, new materials, new especially new chemicals, that I, would, I, I think that's probably a good idea. There's a movie called Pentagon Wars. If you ever want to watch it, that'll show you a lot of things that the DOD has done in years past on where things get forced through and decisions get made that aren't technologically sound anymore just because someone's got to get get the job done. Um, it's, it's a black comedy, but it's based on the launch of the Bradley vehicle. Uh, I'll just leave that for <laughs> extracurricular activity from this. So. All right. Well, is that okay? Uh, well, with that, um, let's thank the panel again. And we greatly appreciate you all being involved today. Thank you. <laughs>